Does that be nice to set up? Ooh! So close! Ooh! Jeremy Hunt. Who's the Prime Minister? Tyrrell, yes, you got it. Well done. We weren't recording that bit where um, <coughs> where we said uh, uh, Boris and not not Theresa May. It was Theresa May was our prime minister who said exactly that, and she said, and the reason she said it, and this is where you all come in. Prosperity is a vital foundation for the long-term stability on which our security depends. You're actually not in the business of just creating prosperity; it's actually security as well. So, first questions. What I want to do with each person is not just for them to introduce themselves just in a sentence, but also one snippet of advice that you think this audience might have overlooked, something which is uncommon, something which you think is, in this age, maybe even tweetable. There's something vital they can take away, and that one key thing, and I'm going to come through lots later on, but just something which you think, you know what, the one thing, advice I give when it comes to exporting uh, and going global, and getting into new markets. And I'm going to start with, because you look more confident <laughs> than the others. The others are just like, oh, God. Jim, <laughs> out So, Jim uh, Durian, country manager of UK and international markets by title. Where am I as a person? I would see myself as an optimist. That's why I think those socks look awesome. The boss of this, <laughs> this chino and um, when it comes to expanding, I would say key takeaway is you will feel lonely at some points, and it's going to be hard and rewarding. Okay, okay, that's fair enough. Abby? Yeah, so I was actually just saying a moment ago that uh, one of the pieces of advice I guess I would give is that with exporting, uh, DIT is def definitely your uh, secret weapon. And uh, over the last uh, number of years, um, you know, I've used uh, the department actually to to help deploy certain things in different countries. So, so to give you some examples, um, you know, we, we recently won uh, a deal with the Egyptian national team. They they didn't uh, win a World Cup since 1992, I think it was. And using genetics, which is only part of the picture, I have to say, we helped them actually prepare and go with them to the national to the National World Cup as a national team. Right. And but, but part of the process, working with government-type organizations, sporting institutions, uh, and just companies abroad, uh, in this case, obviously, the, the Egyptian Football Association, uh, it's very difficult to, to eventually uh, close. At least we, we found that, even though we had a great product, great technology. And so where, where you know, we were able to leverage some of the resources from the department was, and, and this isn't commonly widely known, but you can actually uh, commission one report. So if you want to internationally trade, you can ask uh, DIT to produce a report called an OMIS report, I think that's what called today, to help match make you. But more importantly, actually, you can use the uh, local embassy or consulate to actually uh, send out invitations uh, f from Her Majesty's government to actually invite your target audience uh, to come in for a lunch or a session. And of course, you have to pay for that. Um, but it's very worthwhile. So in, in this particular example, uh, you know, we, we were able to invite key influencers within the Egyptian Football Association, within the Olympic committees, and actually we went on as a result of that lunch to even win some business with uh, one of the Olympic associations for uh, modern day uh, pentathlon, which helped them get gold as well, of course, because of wow. our technology. So, so really exciting. And so, so exporting is, is, can be daunting. Different countries, different ecosystems, different things to do, but DIT definitely can help you navigate that formally through a process which is, we learned OMIS, but also to actually facilitate key meetings and key interactions actually inside ambassador's residence, very important. Because you can flex your muscles. And that's a huge pull, of course, because you've got the yeah, because of, insignia going out on the invite yeah, yeah, yeah. ambassador's residence. Exactly, and you know, in most cases, um, you know, perhaps unless you're Derek, uh, if, you get, if you get a, a letter from uh, Her Majesty's government, you, you, you might not uh, want to turn that down because it's quite important. Uh, so if you, don't, if you don't get them often enough, then so very useful. I'm going to ask the question. How many people have used OMIS here? Wow. Okay, we've got one. Okay, well, I think there's going to be a lot that people can learn in this session. How many are exporting? Just a handful. Just a handful. How many want to export? Well, we're going to convince the ones who don't think they want to the needs <laughs> of why they should, which uh, it comes very neatly on to you, Nicola. Tell us a bit about yourself and, and sort of the big, big piece of advice. Okay. Nicola Benfold. Um, my background is in the electronics industry, um, primarily um, military grade uh, components.
and sales, I had all your wireless with that. Um, and then I worked for various uh, manufacturing consultancies and have done a lot internationally. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to uh, work for the Department of International Trade as an international trade advisor. I'm private employed. I have nine other members of my team covering all elements of uh, tech for London and the South East. And there are seven other such teams across England and there's some other regions as well. Um, and our job is to go out and help companies export, to help de-risk that process, to help you identify what can be exported and what can't. Um, and to help you baseline where you currently are with regards to your aspirations and help you to adapt your product and service, to get yourself ready to export, to know where to go. Uh, and that's my job every day, is to sit in front of companies and have those conversations, and I absolutely love it. It's the most exciting thing to be able to be in a position to enable somebody to be successful. And, and how do they reach out to your team? All sorts of ways. Um, we will come along and speak to events like this. Um, a lot of the time, my client, my current clients will refer others. Um, we will work with the likes of the Global Entrepreneurs Programme because you don't work with the Global Entrepreneurs Programme unless you're great, unless they can see something in you that sets you apart from many other companies that they have been dealing with. So I'm very happy to take that recommendation, if you like, and take the time to sit and talk to you about how we can help you expand and help you grow. So the one takeaway little thing that I would say, and it sounds obvious, but if it's really obvious, I wouldn't have to saying it again and again and again every single day. The big thing about growing a business, particularly with exports, is the world's a very big place. It's very exciting. Your inbox is very busy. The, uh, your website should and will give you a lot of reach. So you must focus. You must have a plan and focus. And the number of times I work with companies who are lately scattered around because they're having fantastic opportunities coming in from Germany, and US and China and Nigeria and Australia and I'm going, oh, come on, there's three of you, you turn over 250,000 pounds, focus. <clears throat> and you have to project yourself forward, see where you want to be, and understand where you want to be in 12 months, 24 months, five years, and then put a plan in that's going to get you there and bring me along or my team along to help you do that. But please focus. I can't tell you one company off the top of my head with a scattergun approach has worked. They've all had to draw back, they've all had to take steps back, and they've all had to start again. And you don't want to waste your time. Thank you. And we're going to come back on some of those points that you've raised. Dylan, you were also in the private sector before joining government. What, tell us a bit about your background, and then also again, one key takeaway that you think you're over. Thanks, Alpesh. So um, I'm on my, my third career, uh, uh, which I don't think it's that unusual these days, but for someone just in their 40s. So I spent my 20s in uh, uh, British military intelligence, which some people think is an oxymoron. Um, I spent my <laughs> 30s in um, software, software sales, and now I'm in my early 40s. I'm um, in uh, the government. Um, but there is one thing that is uh, that connects all of these things, which is technology and sales. So um, when I was in British military intelligence, essentially what I was trying to do was, through the exploitation of technology, was either convince our enemies to stop being our enemies, or convince uh, those who were making decisions that they needed to adhere to my advice to make better decisions. Um, and so uh, we did that through the exploitation of, of technology, which enabled me then to go into technology sales, which I was doing for a number of companies, but uh, ones that you'll know, SaaS and, and Microsoft, primarily in EMEA and overseas. And now um, uh, I head up uh, a large team, as, as Alpha said, covering a number of sectors, but concurrent throughout all of those sectors is that cutting edge of technology is at the heart of it. Um, the, 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 uh, I think Nicholas really um, highlighted the fantastic services that the Department for International Trade provide to support you ex exporting, and we'll probably talk a bit more about that. The other one I would talk about, which is the, the hidden gem, is UK export finance. Now, UK export finance can insure you against not being paid. That is so important, because when I was in technology sales, 
And I used to do business in, in uh, more challenging parts of the world, uh, such as West Africa um, or parts of the Middle East. It was quite challenging to get the directors to sign off on going for the bid, to actually putting resources into a bid team, to actually doing the pre-sales work uh, on these tendering opportunities because there were considerable risks around payment. Now, all you need in order to get UK export finance uh, support is that 20% of the solution, the product, needs to be based in the UK. So it's a fantastic asset. If that's not good enough, they also provide insurance services for your customers. So you can go to your customer and say, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, the British government will insure you against my failure to deliver. Now, of course, I'm not going to fail you. I'm not going to fail to deliver. However, the British government is prepared to underwrite your risk. That puts you at such a competitive advantage, especially when um, our competing uh, export agencies, such as the US, um, is you know under the current administration is, is not uh, having uh, the resources to, to, to compete. The, the difference is that when the Department for International Trade was created, UK export finance's risk appetite was only five billion. Our Secretary of State has increased that to fifty billion. We used to only do it in two currencies. Now I think we do it in about a dozen currencies. So there are fantastic services. We're not just here to help you come to the UK and scale up and get access to finance. We want you to go international and smash those international markets and we will provide firepower to help you do it. So final bit of advice, using the military um, connections and mention of firepower. Two great uh, military uh, statements I was taught at Sandhurst which is uh, time spent on reconnaissance is, is rarely wasted. So doing that proper preparation and, and, and uh, in the intelligence world, we used to call that the intelligence preparation of the environment, IPE. So doing that proper reconnaissance, really understanding your customer. Okay, what is your customer's problem? And then listen to your customer. So doing that, doing that recce. And then, but on the flip side of that is no plan survives contact with the enemy. So be prepared, be prepared for it all to go beat Tom as soon as, soon as you get into that, into that pitch uh, or into that customer meeting. Thank you. Brilliant, you know what they're all thinking so you said British military intelligence there, you're all thinking, oh shit, it's fine. We're gonna get rendition if you don't export. <laughs> you are getting rendition if you don't export. <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned UK export finance. I've got some statistics before I give you the next question. According to UK Export Finance, roughly 400,000 businesses in the UK can export but don't. And they've increased their funding year on year for exactly the facilities you mentioned. Here's another one. UK firms sold more overseas in 2018 and 2019, 639 billion pounds, that's 10 billion per every man, woman and child in the country than at any time since records began. And records began in the First World War, 639 billion in exports. And even better, mm -hmm. even better, <coughs> OEC data shows UK exports grew faster than Germany, France, and Italy between 2016 and 2018. In other words, if you're not exporting, your competitors are. That's for sure, and statistics prove it. So, in terms of the why, we'll come to the how, because we touched 